Last week when we looked at the first Iconoclast era, we looked at how this religious policy against icons impacted Byzantine history at home, and how it also impacted the ability of the Byzantines to deal with foreign powers such as the papacy abroad. And we also talked about the impacts of iconoclasm on their external image. Well, this week we're going to do basically the same thing, but we're going to look at the second iconoclast era, which is approximately a century later. This will enable us to then go through Byzantine history from the end of the first iconoclast era all the way through until 843, and then next week we'll look at Byzantine history from that date up until its peak under Basil II, and then the crisis which led to a Byzantine emperor calling for Western aid against the Turks in Asia Minor. So now with that's out of the way, let's talk about the second iconoclast era. So just to recap, the Empress Irene had been serving as regent while her young son Constantine VI was coming of age, and before he had reached his majority, she had decided to end iconoclasm. And um, this policy had remained in place, however she had been vulnerable for a number of reasons, mainly due to her inability to deal with um, Charlemagne's claiming of the imperial title and also the fact that she blinded her own son to take power. Possibly also, we don't really know exactly how popular iconoclasm was or wasn't. It could be that part of her vulnerability was due to the hostility of iconoclast. Again, one of the problems with the iconoclast controversy is that we actually don't really know the exact strength of each side of the debate, and we also don't really know who the major players of the iconoclast movement are, aside from the emperors who were the leaders of that movement. Now, um, this left Irene vulnerable, and in 802, as she was trying to negotiate a marriage alliance with Charlemagne, she was overthrown by a general named Nicephorus. Now, Nicephorus is not really relevant to the discussion of iconoclasm directly. However, he is worth mentioning if you're looking at Byzantine history as a whole. He ruled from 802 to 811, so you might think he's a fairly um, stopgap kind of guy. He couldn't have done too much of note, but that's not true. He was an experienced civil and military servant, and he also, interestingly enough, claimed descent from the royal house of the Ghassanid Arabs. So if we reach back to the 6th century and 5th and 7th century, he was a, you know, descendant of that royal family. Um, he actually was an iconophile, which is fine, because obviously he's inheriting the throne from Irene, who was similarly disposed. And at this time, um, now that the icons had been restored, there were people out there who really wanted to punish the um, iconoclast. This faction became known as the Zealot Party, and they're called Zealots because their version of orthodoxy is severe and extreme. And um, they were sort of held back to some extent by people like Nicephorus, who really wanted to put this controversy behind the empire and move forward. Um, we mostly have a negative view of Nicephorus due to the fact that his reign is recorded by Theophanes the Confessor, our old friend we've been talking about for a long time now. And uh, Theophanes was a zealot, so he basically saw Nicephorus at best as someone who was soft on heretics. So then you might ask, well, why is Nicephorus getting so much attention? Well, he actually is one of the most important Byzantine emperors of this period because he made some important institutional changes during his time. So Irene had been vulnerable, and one way to stave off potential aristocratic challenges is to relax tax collection, which will make them a little more susceptible to just accepting the way things are. So Irene basically relaxed tax collection, and that had a negative impact on the state and its ability to defend itself and advance its priorities. So once Nicephorus comes into power as a man who has not blinded his own son to take power, he feels legitimate enough to restore full tax collection. And he also institutes a poll tax on all rural inhabitants of his realm, and that boosts revenue quite a bit. So what does he do with this new revenue? Well, he decides that the empire has been weak in the Balkans for too long, so he decides to reestablish control of that region, or at least to some extent. Um, during his campaigns in the Balkans, mostly in Greece, but also in areas that were you know, the Macedonian realm of Philip and Alexander once upon a time, 
He managed to establish the themes of Thrace, the area sort of outside of Constantinople, Macedonia, um, Cephalonia, Dyrrhachium in the west, and then the Peloponnese in the south of Greece. Now, I mentioned this in the video on the Slavs, but also this is the same period where Nikephorus used population transfers from Greek settlements in places like Asia Minor and Sicily to more or less make Greece Greek again. Greek, Greece had been heavily settled by Slavs, so he imported Greeks from other areas, and then they became the dominant group, and the Slavs were more or less assimilated, and Greece was Greek once again. So these are all things that were done under the direction of Nikephorus. He may not have ruled long, but he got the job done. So as you may have gathered, Nikephorus was a successful and powerful ruler, and he managed to keep the peace between the iconophiles and iconoclast, which was a bigger achievement than it sounds like, as we'll see in the future. And um, he also, by setting up these Balkan themes, this isn't just adding color to the map, this is actually really empowering the state going forward. Now, it will take time for these themes to really produce the kind of revenue and soldiery that um, they have the potential to produce, but by establishing them and reestablishing imperial authority, Nikephorus sets the stage for a couple of things. One is the revival of a Balkan population base to recruit. Two is the economic recovery caused by this from revenue. And three is the order brought by the empire, which allows for urban revival. So now the old cities of Greece will once again begin to grow after centuries of decline. And it looks like they were about as bad off as some of the cities we've talked about in um, France at this time. But now they will begin to recover and will become important centers for the empire once more. Now, unfortunately for Nikephorus, he did not rule as long as he might have, and he was unable to do some of the things he may have been planning. I have to assume, based on his um, record of achievement, that he had bigger plans beyond what he had already done. And he was leading an army in battle against Krum the Bulgar in 811, and he was captured and killed. Or maybe he was just killed and his body was captured. I'm not sure exactly how that went down. And uh, his son-in-law was at the battle, Michael I, Ranagabi. He managed to escape and then claim the crown. But um, at the battle, Krum managed to capture Nikephorus, and then he turned his skull into a drinking cup, as is pictured on your screen. So... One of Nikephorus' other legacies is being an important part of the Bulgar King's collection of drinking cups, which is no small feat. In a previous video on Charlemagne, I pointed out that Michael I is mostly just famous for recognizing Charlemagne as emperor. He was the first Byzantine emperor to do so. Irene had refused, even though she had been willing to possibly marry him. And um, Nikephorus had also not um, acknowledged uh, Charlemagne. Some people think that Nikephorus' conquests in the Balkans were actually a response out of panic to the growing power of the Frankish Empire and that he was seeking to strengthen the Byzantine realm in case there was a confrontation. At any rate, um, Michael I did not last long because he was overthrown by a Stratagos named Leo. Now, about a hundred years before, another Stratagos named Leo had also overthrown a weak emperor. That was Leo III, of course. This new emperor, Leo V, is called Leo the Armenian, and he rules for seven years between 813 and 820. And he's somewhat successful. Um, the Bulgars have been running wild ever since their victory over Nikephorus, but now that the Franks are starting to encroach on their territories, they have to shift their focus to fight the Franks. And they see what they think is an opening once Charlemagne dies, so they decide to focus their efforts there, and they have, you know, mixed results, I suppose. But anyway, Leo V had some iconoclast advisors and may have been an iconoclast himself. And when he looked back over the past, uh, you know, several years, he saw that the Empire had been suffering some grievous losses that he couldn't explain. And since he and his advisors were most likely iconoclasts, they naturally thought, well, this is God's way of punishing us for turning back to icons. We weren't dealing with this kind of stuff when we um, were not using icons, so let's just go back to the policy that worked. So that's what they did. 
And in this way, um, Leo V, the Soldier Emperor, was a lot like Leo III, the Soldier Emperor. Both were iconoclast and both were acting from what they saw as pragmatic um, reasons to end the use of icons. And here is where the second iconoclast struggle of the 9th century most differs from the first iconoclast struggle of the 8th century. So, Leo V had some enemies, and one of them was this guy named Michael the Amorian, also known as Michael the Stammerer. And apparently Michael had been plotting against Leo, or Leo was otherwise ill-disposed towards him, and had decided that his execution was necessary. So he had Michael in prison, and he decided to delay the execution for a more suitable and hopefully dramatic day. Well, while Leo was in church... Michael's partisans had plotted to kill him. They dressed up as chorus members, uh, managed to sneak into the church past the guards, and then they brandished their daggers and killed him on, you know, in church. So um, Leo V was dead, and then the conspirators hailed Michael II as the new emperor. Now Michael II would go on the rule for nine years, so that's a pretty good um, turnaround. You know, going from being a guy in prison about to be executed to being the emperor doesn't get much better than that, I suppose. Um, he's a probable iconoclast since he continues iconoclasm that had been started by his predecessor. But he doesn't seem to have really been all that into the cause. He wanted to really reconcile with iconophiles. And he ended sentences of exile that had been started under his predecessor. So if you had been exiled for your love of icons, you were now able to return to the capital and resume your job. He also ended all persecutions. He just kept icons themselves banned. And to try to really throw water on this lingering debate, he decided to just forbid more discussion of the issue. Icons were out. The end. Sounds simple enough. When it comes to Byzantine religion, if you've learned anything, you should know by now that it is never simple. So, there was at least one person who was very unhappy with Michael II's religious policies, and that gentleman is named Thomas the Slav. So rather than running for emperor in his own name, he decided to claim to be the long-deceased Constantine VI, the guy who was blinded by his mother Irene, and had been disgraced in the eyes of most of his subjects because of his controversial divorce from his wife. Now, I guess in the meantime, people had grown fonder of the memory of Constantine VI, and apparently this was a powerful name to bandy about. I guess no one questioned the fact that Thomas was not blind. I don't know. Anyway, Thomas fled to the Caliph and asked for support, and he managed to basically build a coalition of people who were on the outs. Iconophiles, dispossessed ethnic groups, the heretical Polican movement, which was very strong in Asia Minor at this time. Um, most modern scholars are of the opinion that this was not so much a reform movement as it was just sort of a gathering of a coalition to back an imperial candidate and that Thomas was more or less playing to the sensibilities of people to get their support and he may or may not have actually cared about their cause. Um, common tactic for all politicians, whether they're running for emperor or president or whatever the case might be. Um, he ended up being crowned by the Bishop of Antioch, um, who was acting also under the direction of the Caliph, who thought this was a great idea for reasons that don't need to be explained. And once he returned to Byzantine territory, he was able to gain the support of a lot of soldiers and civilians in the east. Um, he was powerful enough that he controlled most of Asia Minor from about 821 to 823, and he actually was able to lay siege to Constantinople in 821, but he ended up getting scattered by the Bulgars when they arrived as allies. And um, from my understanding, the Bulgars entered into an alliance with the Byzantines during the time of Michael I. So that was actually one of his accomplishments that I had papered over. Um, anyway, this obviously ends up you know, paying dividends for Michael II. Or maybe it was Leo V who um, you know, made the alliance with the Bulgars. I don't remember. Either way... Uh, Michael II was the beneficiary of one of his predecessor's actions. Um, after the siege of Constantinople ended, uh, the Thomas of Slav and his followers started to run out of steam, and then by 823 the revolt collapses and Thomas ended up being captured and executed. Michael II tried his best to steer a middle ground even while dealing with Thomas the Slav, and 
He was undermined at every turn by a strong and active zealot party led by Theodore Studius, who was pictured on your left. Um, now, this party would really try to push hard for the full restoration of icons and also the condemnation of iconoclast. Well, that wasn't going to happen when you had an emperor like Michael II who was an iconoclast and wanted the issue to not be discussed. Um, so the zealots, instead of working through the Byzantine system, uh, obviously the you know patriarchy is uh, controlled by the emperor, decided to appeal to the pope, who obviously was al always interested in trying to assert his religious supremacy over the patriarch and emperor at Constantinople. So the zealots went behind uh, Michael's back and tried to get help from Rome. And when a papal envoy arrived and started making demands of the emperor, Michael II got angry and jailed this papal envoy and mistreated him. And that would further damage relations between the Byzantine Empire and the Pope. If we are to sort of creatively look at Leo V and Michael II as between them um, comprising someone like a Leo III, then we can also see Theophilus, Michael's son, as a latter-day Constantine V, because he, like Constantine, was a highly learned iconoclast, and in addition, he also is an admirer of Arab culture, as seen in his uh, picture here on his uh, inauguration. He had a lot of uh, Arab friends and advisors. And he was taught by John the Grammarian, who was one of the most intellectually accomplished of all the iconoclasts. Um, one of the most famous events of Theophilus' reign is when his mother held a bride show for the young man, and he chose a beautiful young woman named Theodora, who was known, or at least later became known as a Niconophile. So presumably she was already that at the time, but she kept it in the closet. Um, his other choice at the time was a poet who would later become famous named Cassia, and many people have basically tried to imply that he made a mistake by choosing Theodora over Cassia because Cassia wrote poems and religious music which are still used by the Orthodox Church today. However, I would point out that Cassia went to a monastery afterwards and that it's possible that this seclusion and lack of um, responsibility for raising children and dealing with imperial politics is what gave her the leisure to write the poems and songs that she wrote. And it wouldn't have, you know, she might not have uh, had the same achievement level as a poet had she become the empress. So, you know, maybe we wouldn't have even remembered her, even if she had become empress. I don't know. Anyway, um, under Theophilus, things continued to go badly militarily. Um, the Aglubid Emirate, which established itself in Tunisia, having broken away from the Abbasid Caliphate, began to invade Sicily and South Italy during the time of Theophilus and they would complete this conquest by the late 870s when they'd seize Syracuse in 878. Um, Theophilus was somewhat more successful in the east. He managed to strengthen the frontier there. And like Nicephorus, he also made one internal improvement which would have greater significance long after he was dead, and that is allowing local mints to print money, uh, mostly lower denomination money that you could use for daily transactions. And that would help remonetize the Byzantine economy and really help to foster trade between Byzantium and its neighbors and also between Byzantine subjects. Up to this point, the second iconoclastic era had been largely free from any major persecutions. However, as Theophilus continued to struggle in Italy against the um, invasions of the Arab forces there, he began to look for a scapegoat and once again the iconophiles loomed large in his mind. So he appointed his former tutor John the Grammarian as Patriarch in 837, and the two of them oversaw a persecution of iconophiles, and probably at Theophilus's urging, they decided to go after the Zealot Party in particular, and especially the monks who led them, because they were a politically destabilizing force, and they were a target that needed to be dealt with from the perspective of imperial prerogatives. But in 842, Theophilus died, and his three-year-old son was left behind, Michael III, later known as the Drunkard, and um, his wife Theodora was one of the principal regents. 
And up to this point, everybody assumed that Theodora shared her husband's religious views of iconoclasm, but they were wrong. As soon as Theodora took over as regent in 843, her primary goal was to restore the icons. And she came in at a time that was favorable to her cause. And she was able to gain some high-ranking allies who would, were willing to help her out. Um, the timing in general was good. There had been military disasters under the last three emperors, all of whom had been avowed iconoclasts, and the last of whom had you know, engaged in open persecution. So at this point, it was clear to everyone that regardless of the Empire's stance on icons, it could still suffer military victory or defeat at any time, and that these two things were not very closely correlated. So the strongest argument that people have been making in favor of iconoclasm was now more or less discredited. And to help matters along, Theodora decided to try to get some of the iconoclasts on her side, by spreading a rumor that Theophilus had repented of iconoclasm on his deathbed. And this is also a way for her to then um, justify her own stance on the issue without making it seem like she's inserting her own opinion. Remember, this is the Middle Ages and she's a woman, so she has to move with a greater degree of caution than a male would do. Um, and the final step, of course, is getting rid of John the Grammarian, the iconoclast icon, which I guess is kind of a play on words that I did not plan, but I'm proud of myself nonetheless. Anyway, um, he, of course, was the leader of the iconoclast faction, so he had to go, and she was able to install a favorable patriarch. And then early in Michael III's reign, they all met together and decided that icons were back, and this is more or less the end of the story of iconoclasm. So now let's talk about the long-term consequences of the second iconoclast era. So after 843, there were no more iconoclast emperors. No one else would try to get the icons removed. Um, this, of course, is a huge boost to artists and icon makers, and this was probably their most profitable period. It was now a boom industry. Everybody wanted to erect icons. They were something that Byzantium did well, and this led to a lot of artistic creativity with people trying to recover old forms and develop new ones, so this ended up being one of the best eras for Byzantine art. And you might think, hey, well, they've fought over all kinds of crazy stuff over the last few centuries, so maybe they've hammered out what orthodoxy is and how it should be practiced and maybe now this will end religious controversies in Byzantium. Ha, <laughs> no. So the new battle lines, the zealot party remains and they are for strict, unbending adherence to the rules. So they're basically the Dwight Schrute faction of Byzantine orthodoxy. Then you have the politicians. And they're much more flexible. They think if you're trying to convert, say, a foreign power, it's okay to bend some of their cultural norms and, you know, be pretty loose. You can also anoint laymen once in a while and then hurry them into higher offices if that's expedient. So, and they also, each side has its own um, readings of scriptures and theology to back them up. So the politicians, even though they're labeled as politicians by their opponents, uh, some of them actually are monks and theologians and not just people who are in the imperial camp. So, just to make that clear, although obviously most of the emperors are in the politician camp, but a few might have been zealots. So it's not 100% clear, but basically if you look at what somebody did for a living in this time, you could tell whether they were a zealot or a politician. At least we're talking about the highest echelons of society. Um, zealots during this time were usually monks or led by monks. Uh, as I said earlier, they favor strict orthodoxy. And then politicians are just more flexible, but they could be anybody, but usually they are either people who um, are emperors, imperial family members, or people who want to be on good terms with imperial family members. One thing that helped out the zealots during this period is that because their stance for icons had won out, they were now seen in a more heroic light, and this really increases their stature in Byzantine society as a whole. So after 843, monks will become more influential in the East than they had been for quite a while. 
And next time when we pick up, we'll be in 843 with the reign of Michael the Drunkard. And we'll go all the way up to the reign of Alexius I. And that will get us in a good position to then talk about the First Crusade.